Welcome to the Cashflow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cashflow Project. I'm your host, Duke Ong with Tri City Equity Group. Today we have Tony and Gaudi on the show. We are partners on 15 units in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And with me is my co-host, Vince Gettings. Hey, Duke. Awesome show today with Tony. Um, definitely want to take a listen. He, he has some awesome uh, golden nuggets on utility optimization, um, you know, what to look for when, when choosing partners, uh, especially out of state, which is what Tony specializes in. Uh, and then also how to structure debt partnerships. Um, in order to scale business and acquire acquire assets and build build his uh, portfolio, so you definitely want to stay tuned in uh, for those. Tony Angotti is a realtor and real estate investor that got started by purchasing a duplex and house hack. He continues to purchase rental real estate and works with investors to do the same. Specializing in remote and out of state investors has been key to his growth as a realtor. And he provides a tremendous amount of service, including consulting with clients to determine the submarkets of Pittsburgh that they should be based in, uh, based on their goals, taking walkthrough videos and pictures for properties of interest, scouring the market for both on and off market, cash flowing property, and meticulously tailoring the search for investment properties to each customer. Tony has grown his rental real estate holdings to roughly 80 units, which are managed by his own in-house team and focuses on buying small to mid-sized apartment buildings. He lives in Dormont, a suburb of Pittsburgh, with his wife and two cats. When he isn't working on real estate, he enjoys ice hockey, backcountry camping, learning new things, and exercising as much as possible. He and his wife still live in a duplex and consider house hacking to be the cheat code to financial independence. Tony, welcome to the show. Hey, I didn't know my bio was being read like for my website, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so how did you get started in your journey to earn passive cash? Yeah, so we started out house hacking, um, as you mentioned. Uh, we were both, my wife and I, both working W-2 jobs. She, we weren't married at the time, um, just renting, and then I kind of wasn't fulfilled by working for someone else. So I was always looking for different ways to get out of that, and my wife actually introduced me to the bigger pockets podcast, which she wasn't really a listener to. She just kind of found it searching on the internet. Um, I gave it a listen, like the concept of house hacking thought it was a win, win, win solution. Like you already have to pay to live somewhere. So why not learn how to build passive income while you're living in your investment? So that's how we got started um, on our third duplex that way. So we've been moving from place to place to place been investing for somewhere between four and five years now. I don't really remember exactly the date that we started, but yeah, that's how we got started. And how did you decide on real estate? Um, like I said, I mean, I was just kind of pretty much listening to the bigger pockets podcast was probably the initial thing. Um, decided on real estate because of, I guess, leverage. I didn't, I don't think that was, like a word that I was really thinking of at the time, but it was pretty much just, I could start buying assets with a little bit of money by house hacking. And that was the way for me to grow um, towards passive income rather than saving up money for the stock market over a large number of years. I could use just a little bit of my own cash, leverage that into a bigger investment and build cash flow that way. That was my thought at the beginning. All right, that makes sense. Um... So what is your why for building passive cash flow? I think that there's a lot of things that motivate me in life that don't really pay the bills, so to speak. So like I said, I like to be outside. I like to be camping, stuff like that. Um, I like being able to sort of live life on my own terms and not be tied to obligations from someone else, like external factors. So building passive cash flow and real estate is, mostly passive because like I said, I manage my own team. So it's not like it'll ever be truly passive, but um, 
will give me the flexibility to kind of do what I want from wherever I want to do it. Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. So tell me about that team building process. Like, how did you set that up? Yeah. So at the beginning, I kind of did pretty much everything. I was the property manager, handyman, uh, numbers guy, okay, like every different task um, at the beginning. And then I just realized that if I wanted to grow, that formula wasn't going to be sustainable. So I needed to put a team together. And the options there are either hire an outside property manager or bring somebody in to your own group. Um, and the decision to bring them in was because I work with a lot of out-of-state investors, as you mentioned from my bio as a realtor. And while property managers aren't horrible, I find that they don't really deliver the quality of service that I want and the level of like oversight of the investment that I want. So I brought in my own employee to take on a lot of the tasks. We, I found that employee just by tapping my network, um, just asking who might be a good fit. And um, the person that works for me to manage the property, she's been doing a great job. So it's been a great hire. And then now I'm actually in the process of hiring my first W-2 employee because um, our, pro our property manager, she's 1099 because I just give her tasks and she manages them as is appropriate. But then the W-2 employee we're bringing in will be a handyman. So all the maintenance responsibilities that she has will be separated over to the like dispatch and stuff like that will be pushed over to the handyman. The handyman was also really easy to find because it's my dad. So um, that's going to be really, uh, you know, simple transition, somebody that I can trust. Even if it wasn't my dad, I was looking for someone that I could like trust basically not to misuse their time. So somebody that's going to, um, you know, be honest about their hours, what they're doing, somebody who can give the level of customer service that I want for the tenant uh, and then work well as a team too. And the process was just easy because <laughs> I guess in a weird way, I've been interviewing them for more than 30 years. <laughs> so, wow. That's, that's awesome. They're able to hire your dad. Um, yeah. I mean, we're waiting to pull the trigger until after all the uh, coronavirus stuff is over, just because if I'm hiring them away from a job, I want to make sure that it's a permanent, mostly permanent thing. I mean, barring some crazy unforeseen circumstance versus, something where like maybe money stops coming in and then we have to like make cuts. I'm not looking to do that to somebody. <laughs> My dad, number one, and yeah. number two wouldn't be looking to do that to any person in general. So that's where so that is. Why, why did you decide on W2 versus 1099? So a lot of the tasks that I'd be using the handyman for are, they don't really fit under a 1099 arrangement. So, for instance, the handyman's going to be taking all the maintenance calls from the tenants directly. The handyman's going to be dispatching um, contractors. They're expected to be available for eight hours a day um, during set hours, so you can't do that with a 1099 employee. Um, additionally, to hire somebody good, you need to be able to offer benefits. So, you know, I have to ha bring them on so I can offer benefits. Um, a lot of things like that too, plus insurance. So if you have a contracting company, like you have insurance to protect you if their work is not done appropriately that, and it provides a level of stability. So I have a couple handymen that I use now for my portfolio, but one of them is retired from his day job. So he could be done being a handyman whenever he's already doing it just for fun, more or less. And then the other one that I use a lot is, I mean, he works another job. So there's a little bit of instability there that the more units that you have, I need to be able to count on someone consistently. And finding that person to do all sorts of little tasks for you is very difficult to source if you don't have total control over that person. So that's the other reason. Um, but W-2 versus 1099, to answer your question directly, is strictly because of how I plan to control their job tasks. So, like, I can't, I can't get away with cheating, you know, the system that way. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So tell me about the most unique or interesting deal that you've invested in. That's a hard question. I mean, I've been, I guess a lot of the, almost everything that I've done has had a value add component. So they've all been like improvement. Um, I wouldn't, they've all been that way. So I wouldn't say that one has been way more unique than the others. They've all just come with their own difficulties. Um, the most difficult one is I purchased a building that had, I didn't know to screen for it at the time, but the prior owner had put in, I think, three to five people with eviction history, a bunch of people with criminal background. It was a 10 unit building and pretty much all the tenants that we inherited were duds. So we had to get rid of them. During that process, one of the tenants son robbed the bank. So the FBI like came to the building. Um, I was accused of racist practices because we told them to get rid of grills on the property. So they reported me for whatever reason, because I said they couldn't have grills. And then that got dropped real fast because it obviously wasn't a thing. But this whole process with that building has been 80, 80% of the effort for the most part. Um, it's the big reason why I probably won't buy another building in C or D class properties, any like areas anymore. I just don't have the patience or the right personality for that i just there's been so much stuff that's gone on with that building that's just been a nightmare to deal with we had someone kick the front door uh glass it's not even in a d-class neighborhood it's just it's stupid stuff that happens people spray paint the side of the building sometimes they have to clean it off uh i don't know <laughs> what, what neighborhood is that in uh that's in swiss fail um which is a neighborhood kind of right outside of the city limits. And it's really not a bad area. Um, I think for us, it was more the initial populace that we inherited that was, um, we just needed to kind of turn through some of that. And then as we started to turn through it, the building has been getting better. Like the FBI is not at the building anymore. The police aren't talking to us directly about stuff. Uh, Things have been cleaner. It's just been way smoother um, since we got rid of the primary troublemakers. Yeah, what, what's helped us out um, similar type issues is getting like really good exterior lighting, like mm -hmm. 10,000 lumen LED lights to like light up the whole area. Like there's no shadowy areas where some kid's going to come spray paint this side of the building in the middle of the night. Like, so there's stuff like that. Yeah. And, like, Go to we, Amazon, yeah, yeah, and get the uh, pretty much you know air, areas under surveillance signs. Um, yeah, go, we have those. those we, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, we have those. We put up uh, cameras um, that may or may not actually work, uh, <laughs> just in case. The but it's are funny because they've <laughs> they've already they've already caught on. They all already uh, know. So now <laughs> what we're actually go what we're actually going to do is we're probably going to add um, Wi-Fi service to the building like and put Wi-Fi cameras up and then we're going to sell inner like we're going to like subdivide it and then sell that wireless back to the tenants yeah, for do like a rub on it or something yeah like well no we'll just say here's the route like your router you can set up users on routers so that they have their own password to their own version okay. of it and then say like if you want access to it it's fifteen dollars a month and we'll still turn like a slight profit on the internet but it's also like where are they going to get internet for fifteen dollars a month they're not and yeah. this isn't the highest this isn't the highest income area either so not only will that be like a little bit of a service to them even though the internet's probably going to be slow because there's going to be a bunch of people using whatever it is but it'll be a way to make our cameras paid for by the people that live there so there's that too. Nice. Yeah, that's a good tip. So how, how is that building performing in the uh, current environment? Fine. I mean, you mean because of coronavirus? Yeah, is yeah. that what you're yeah. referencing? Um, it's been okay. I mean, we had a little bit of delay with one tenant, um, but he ended up getting assistance from a, a program 
to pay his rent that was owed, and then his unemployment has finally started to kick in, so he'll be making more regular payments. And then um, we did have one eviction going on prior to coronavirus stuff when they put, like, a stay on eviction. So our we were originally scheduled for March 28th, which was uh, an unfortunate time to be scheduled for because then it got like pushed so that guy was potentially going to be able to stay there all the way through probably middle of june when we were rescheduled to go back after that however i talked to him and just said look he he had a place to go so it wasn't like he was going to be out on the street and i just said like look if you just leave i'll just drop the case I'll use your security. To, I'm keeping your deposit, but I'll drop the case. It won't go on your record as an eviction. We won't file a judgment for you for the amount of money that you owe. You'll get out of this way better off if you just leave. Just get out at the end of April and be done. And he decided, even though he wasn't the most kind person to talk to, he did, he did decide to just leave. So that kind of helped. Um, That's good. But. So are you still able to like turn units and get them uh, on the market in this state? So Pennsylvania is, I believe, the only state remaining where real estate is not considered essential. Really? So we, we aren't a life-sustaining industry. So it's really uh, ambiguous what you're actually allowed to do and not do. So we've just been telling the contractors to do what's right for their business as far as turning vacant units. Most of them have just said, we'll just do the work. They either have a waiver to be allowed to perform it or they're fine going because it's vacant or something like that. So for the most part, they've been doing the work to turn vacant units. As far as leasing the units is concerned, you're not allowed to do it as a licensed person because the risk is that you could lose your license or face fines. But as an owner, there's, you're probably not supposed to, but there's no specific rule I've seen that says you can't let somebody into your place. So what we've been doing for the ones that we own, not the ones that we property manage is we've just been showing up, unlocking the door, sitting in the car outside letting the tenant go in, walk through the unit, and then when they're done, just locking up, wiping down the keypads and the doorknobs and everything in between people. And that's how we've still been showing them. But it is pretty convoluted in Pittsburgh, just considering we're not life-sustaining, I guess, for some reason. Yeah, so recording this uh, in early May. So when uh, when do you think like all that is supposed to lift and reopen back up for Pennsylvania? I don't really want to get too political, but <laughs> um, the the uh, so the governor of Pennsylvania put together a standard. He said that if a county has less than fifty new cases per one hundred thousand people population wise in that county they're allowed to go to the next stage he calls it and in the yellow stage which is the next one business is allowed to continue with safety practices and everything in place the county that pittsburgh is in already meets that criteria however the governor's office just said you're still not allowed to reopen on may 8th when all the other yellow counties are reopening the reasoning for that is not very well described. They said population density, but that makes no sense because the numerical figure of 50 new cases per 100,000 people kind of factors in yeah. population density, right? So it doesn't really make <laughs> sense. Um, so I suspect May 18th maybe, but they've given no timeline. The leadership at our state level of government has been very poor as far as letting business owners know how they should and will be able to conduct their business in the future. There's no real guidance. It's just kind of seems like whatever the state government feels. It's been difficult. 
that's the least caustic way I can describe that situation. Yeah, but we have a similar <laughs> situation in Hawaii. Um, like, you know, we have one of the lowest, like, um, you know, cases per, cap per capita in the nation, yet our local government is super conservative and, um, you know, have, have still kept a lot of uh, non-essential businesses closed. Um, and they're slowly rolling it out. But uh, in my opinion, a little bit slower than they should, given the, you know, the numbers. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what is the biggest mistake that you've made and what have you learned from that in your real estate investing career? The biggest mistake that I've made, I mean, the biggest mistake is probably just not getting started sooner and just, um, you know, that opportunity cost there. I think that it's not like this was an idea that I had even in college. I mean, I'm 30 now, so I'm like almost 10 years out of college, but it's something that probably if I would have got it started closer to right when I got out of school, I would have been able to buy at a much better time when things were cheaper. I know that I had an opportunity to buy my grandfather's house for really cheap. That was, yeah, uh, forty-five or fifty thousand dollars. I could have bought it for, and now it's probably worth like a hundred and forty, hundred and fifty. So it would have been, you know, better to start earlier. Same thing with just kind of that opportunity cost. I probably should have hired someone to help me way sooner than I did. Um, it probably would have let me grow a lot faster. I know that even now things have been so much better since I don't have. Um, have to think so much about the day to day because it's sort of handled. It lets me focus on other stuff like growing my real estate business as an agent and also growing the investment income. So that's probably the biggest mistake. Um, everything else, it's hard for me to say mistake because I know that this sounds cliche, but I view them more as learning experiences than I do mistakes. There's not been a huge mistake that's put me under. So, mm. So with uh, you know, coronavirus and you're talking about opportunity costs and getting started a little bit later, are you looking to kind of make up for that and, like now with you know, the possible dip we're going to have like now in the markets? Are you, are you actively looking for, for you know, opportunities? Just um, I would say that we're open to opportunities and we are still keeping up our lead generation stuff like we always have. However, at least locally in Pittsburgh, the market might go down a little bit, but I don't think that it's going to be pushed into some giant buyer's market opportunity sort of thing. Um, reason being that I think, like I said, we'll return to business sooner rather than later. There'll be a subset of the population that's hit, but most tenants locally are still paying their rent from people that I talk to other landlords that I know my own portfolio. I mean, we only have at this point, I actually don't even have anyone who's unpaid. So everybody's paid up to date. Um, obviously not all of our payments haven't rolled in for May yet, but for April, everything, uh, everything was paid. I expect the same for May. Nobody came out and said they won't be paying or anything. Um, for most of the residential tenants, we do have a few storefronts and stuff like that, that I know at least one is closing. So those are going to be a little bit harder to fill, I think. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for me to fill a storefront when people can't even work. Like, who's going to rent my storefront? Um, so that's going to be a bit of a drain. But as far as the answer your question directly, I mean, if there are opportunities, we would still pursue them and buy them. But I just have my doubts that at least locally it's going to be some opportunity rich area. I think that the opportunity coming forward will be to get terms. So to get sellers who will find it like seller finance stuff to you. Um, because I do think that the banks will tighten up a little bit, at least for the next six to 12 months, probably. So then anybody who does need to sell, they'll probably be more likely to sell to you with some, uh, seller finance terms. That's probably where the opportunity where the opportunity will be versus just pricing of places going cheaper. It might get a little bit cheaper. Prices might go down, but I don't think that they're going to like bottom out to the point that it's a significantly better situation than we are in currently locally to Pittsburgh. 
that might be different in every other market. Yeah, we're looking for um, possible seller financing as well. That's what kind of what we're thinking about our, our markets. Uh, so we're just changing our lead generation, tweaking a little bit to target some more people that, you know, they, they've owned their properties for 20, 30 years, probably have low mortgage balances and things like that. Um, so, yep, we're, we're right there with you on there. So what is your favorite ninja trick for increasing NOI uh, by either <laughs> increasing the income or decreasing expenses? I guess, I mean, it would depend on which side. So we have targeted buildings that have combined heat, uh, combined like heat expense. And we've done a pretty good job of separating out the heat, which then leads to a pretty large increase in the NOI. So that's one thing to look for. Um, we don't do, we haven't done any like rubs analysis, like the ratio billing stuff. We've just actually separated it out, whether it's a bunch of our buildings have a central boiler. So a gas boiler that heats up water, pushes it to the whole system. And then one central heating unit heats the whole building. That's usually gas. So in a lot of these buildings, they have one gas meter for the building, but separate electric for every unit. So we've taken people from the gas heat to putting mini split units in there. Mini splits are just the wall mounted heat and air conditioning. Um, in Pittsburgh, you have to get the more expensive ones because it gets cold, but we've just paid for the upgraded ones. Um, and we've seen greater than 60% reduction in the utility bills from the prior owners billing. Um, looking back, we, we kept the storefronts on the building heat. Um, probably should have just separated them out too, but we didn't. So the next building we're going to, that we do this with, we're going to take, we're going to experiment with electric baseboard heating instead of the mini splits. It's cheaper to do, but provides lower quality to the tenants. So we're going to use that to experiment with in, the, in another building that we have and see if the tenants leave because of it. If they don't leave, then we might just move towards electric heat for all of them. But we'll have to see how the vacancy rates impacted. So I think looking for utility um, optimization is one thing on the expense side. On the income side, I think that, that that one's a little bit more simple. I mean, you just have to look at like what the market rent for the area is. Um, not super complicated to figure that out. And then look for buildings that have a pretty decent spread and easy stuff to upgrade. So like in Pittsburgh, most of our units that are out there to rent, most of our competition is very, they're very dated units. So they're not updated at all. So all that we have to do is come in, update a little bit cosmetically to make a place look clean. And then we can rent it at the top of the market, whereas the old landlord was renting middle market or lower end of the market, that sort of thing. Um, and we also, most people just take pictures with their cell phones in Pittsburgh. So like we have real pictures taken, which makes it show better. Um, so that's kind of helped us. And then just better customer service too, to reduce the vacancy rate. So there's a lot of different levers to pull, but the biggest ninja trick, if I had to pick one, I guess would be the, um, the utility optimization probably. Nice. Are you doing any kind of water conservation? Cause that's one of my big ones too. Um, adding like flow limiting devices and like the faucets and like low flow shower heads and toilets and stuff like that. You ever thought about that? Stuff? Um, we've thought about it. And then once we get a handyman, we might switch over to some of that stuff, but it's kind of like a, um, you know, it's not the top priority with most of these buildings. So it's a little bit like a down the road thing that we've thought of. Um, I don't think low flow toilets work, so I'll never put a low flow toilet in. Uh, they just, you get clogs more often. They're just a more garbage product. Um, yeah. So like, I don't feel like getting calls for people to unclog toilets. Um, and then, uh, but the faucets and maybe the shower heads, though I find that tenants complain about the low flow shower heads sometimes. We did put a couple of those on and Maybe it would be different if they came into it, like if that was what it was when they were there. But if you put it on after they're used to another one, then they're kind of, <laughs> they don't like that as much. Yeah. Um, and that would be a stupid reason to have somebody leave. But we are pretty, um, part of our yearly maintenance is like 
dye testing the toilet. So we make sure that the toilets aren't leaking water and little things like that. We check for drips as part of the maintenance and everything too. So um, that's some of what we've done. Nice. Um, for your in-house uh, management, what kind of like asset management systems are you using? You know, you said that customer service is big for you. So uh, like what kind of front end systems are you using for the, the tenant engagement? And then what are you using on your back end for managing uh, the, like those properties? Um, so we use Buildium is the primary property management tool that keeps all of our, um, my assistant scans all of the, well, my property manager, she scans all the um, receipts and everything that we get and then uploads them into the system under their file. So we don't like that. That's our record keeping software. Then we also um, do most of the payment through Buildium. So most of the tenants are set up in there to pay their, their rent, um, that or some other system, but most of them have been transferred over to Buildium. And then it has all our files too. We can do background checks through it. So most everything runs through Buildium. And then accounting wise, um, it depends on the company. So I have five companies now. Um, three of them just use spreadsheet. One of them, um, Stessa. And then another one is my own. And I've just started to do uh, QuickBooks. I just set it up. So I'll have QuickBooks together. And then the, the accountant does all the 1099. So that's how he manages sending those out. Yeah. We just upgrade it to, uh, from Sessa to QuickBooks across the R's. And I don't know which version we got. We either got a QuickBooks pro or something like that, but it, it's pretty cool because it has a class allocation. So you can have mm -hmm. each property like completely like in a silo inside QuickBooks. So it's pretty cool, but um, I wouldn't know how to set it up. We just have, we hired a, a virtual bookkeeper and she's awesome. So she set it up for a kiss uh, for my company. She looked at it and she's like, oh, wow, you're doing this all wrong. Cause like I set up QuickBooks <laughs> and I was like, I yeah. thought it was pretty good. I took some, you know, accounting classes in, in college. Um, she's like, no, this is all wrong. And then she fixed it and then uh, advised that, Hey, if you, you know, get the next level up, you have this class allocation uh, that you can do in QuickBooks online. And it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, all your reports I, can be separate. Yeah. I mean, I'm experimenting with it for my own personally held properties. So there's not a mm -hmm. ton of those. Um, and like I have, all I did so far was connect my credit cards and my bank accounts and I haven't done anything else. <laughs> yeah. So we'll find out how that goes. I don't think yeah. I'll, not going to be in the position to hire a virtual bookkeeper, but I'll probably pay my accountant to set up all the accounts and he'll gladly do that so that he gets a much more organized mm -hmm. file than yeah. what I give him. Yeah. So do you use uh, virtual assistants for any tasks? No. Uh, the closest to that that we get is for marketing. We have hired um, task rabbits. They're not virtual, but we've hired task rabbits to like lick and stick postcards and letters. So okay. like we've hired them just to send out our mailing pieces before. Okay. Um, our initial mailings, now that we're, you know, we've hit most of the multifamily buildings in our geography. So now that we've hit them all once, there's only 30 to 60 of them that go out a month. So that's been our director of acquisitions, which is just one of my business partners to that company. <laughs> nice. We all give ourselves titles to make it seem like it's a much bigger company than it really is, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Right on. Uh, so you mentioned that you specialize in working with out of state investors. I know Duke's one of your partners. Um, you know, our strategy is very similar. Uh, we we, mm -hmm. we found there's definitely an, um, a need to help, you know, investors in some markets, uh, get into other markets where they can deploy their capital and, and make it work for them. Um, so do you have any insight or tips on how to develop those partnerships? Um, so a little bit different because you guys are looking for out of state investors to invest in your deals, correct? Not, um, so by working with out of state investors, I'm 
I was meaning as a real estate agent. So as like a realtor, okay. um, my business partners were also all out of state, but I only have three. One of my partnerships is with Duke. And then another one of my partnerships has two, two people from originally California that one of my partners did move to Pittsburgh now for that company. And all of those people started out as realtor clients. Um, we do. So I already kind of knew them fairly well from working with them, at least had a good idea of their character. So that was, that, that was the biggest thing to me was just finding somebody who had kind of the same character, same sort of attitude towards investing, that kind of thing. Um, that was the most important for me as far as finding a partner to invest with. Same thing for a lot of your listeners. Like, you know, they're looking for somebody to give their capital to that's going to be trustworthy. Um, I was the operator, so a little bit different. Uh, you know, my other business partners, though, they all have roles in the companies, too. So everybody kind of does a little bit here and there. But we do raise money from outside people, mostly as debt partners, though. So it's mostly private capital. And the way that we've done that has been all friends and family type money. Um, so I'm not really doing like syndications. My two business partners from my other company are both, uh, they worked in tech in California. So they have a lot of friends who had a lot of free cash that they weren't really doing anything with. So we get private financing from them at around 8% um, interest on, on that money. So uh, that's, that's kind of what we've, we've done. I don't know if that answers your question directly. Um, um, I could talk more about working with out-of-state customers as a realtor, but yeah. That's... So the, uh, well, the, the, the debt partners, so you said you, you use them as a debt partnership or debt lender and um, 8%. And then, so you use them for like just uh, acquisition and then you refinance them out. Is that the pretty much the basic Correct. strategy? Yeah, okay. that's what we've been doing. Um, and then, sim I mean, with the apartment buildings, it's a little bit of a simpler equation because the value on the outs just based on the cap rate. So we can pretty easily predict um, what the value on the out will be to refinance them out because we've been investing mostly in the same neighborhood. So we've seen now a whole bunch of different appraisals in our neighborhood. So we have a whole bunch of data points as far as what cap rate will we get on the refi and that allows it to be a little more predictable all right so um what is the best book that you recommend other than rich dad poor dad <laughs> actually rich dad poor dad is not even my favorite one it's not even really up there but it seems like everybody <laughs> recommends it all the time it's yeah, a good it's book appreciate. it's a good like <laughs> intro but i think i read it after i already knew a decent amount of the basics so it really didn't resonate with me that well the I could name a bunch of the ones that everybody reads, but the one that actually has benefited my business the most recently, I read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, and there's also a book called The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, but The Millionaire Real Estate Agent one was almost more applicable to me across the board because it was all about just building a business and like outsourcing certain tasks and making sure that you have the right team members in place and all those sorts of things. Whether you're the passive investor relying on a team of people um, that aren't your employees to help you, or whether you're doing things like me where you're insourcing everything, the book just provided a lot of benefits with like how you should be building your network, how you should be building your team, how you should be doing those sorts of things. And then The Millionaire Real Estate Investor itself is a really good book too about just investing in real estate um, as your Gary primary Keller, means right? of investing. Yeah, Gary Keller's both yeah. of them. Um, and then I did read the, um, bigger pockets one. This is more than one book, but the bigger pockets, long distance one real estate. Yeah, um, Green. yeah, I read that more just to get in the mindset of my customers, but that provided a lot of the same value. Like how do you build trust with people when you can't see or meet with them directly? Um, it was pretty useful for that. And what's your superpower? I say pretty level. <laughs> I think that's probably my superpower. Like I don't, um, you know, sometimes I get like, you know, you get minor frustrations and stuff that you work out. But as far as questioning the whole strategy, I don't really let any one thing external influence my thought of the ultimate goal and what I'm trying to build. 
So I don't let that stuff do too much there. That's probably it. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's a common trait for uh, a lot of successful investors, especially in these challenging times. So um, what is your favorite travel destination? I like to mix it up. So I don't really like to go to the same place twice all that often. Um, I really liked Hawaii when I went. I've been there now twice. That's pretty sweet. Um, and then I also really like San Francisco as a city to go to, to visit. I don't think I could live there. It would be too wacky for me to live there. But the thing that I like about visiting there is that every place you go is like a new city almost. Like if you walk all around San Francisco, every neighborhood feels like a whole different place that you went. It's bizarre. So that's a pretty cool place to visit, I think. They have really good food. That's the, I, I used yeah. to live in the Bay Area for like seven years and um, okay. they had like, you name like any kind of food, they have like, you know, a hundred different options and they're all great. So yeah, Bay, yeah, for sure. And then I, really though, the different parts of it are the craziest thing. Cause we like walked all the way across the city um, and we ended up the next day going to the Muir Woods, that mm -hmm. area. And I was like, we've gone on feels like seven vacations in three days because every place we went is all different. Like the beach, the inner city, we went to uh, the Tenderloin by accident, which was, that was not a, a <laughs> wonderful place we saw a lot of very uh, exciting and weird things but <laughs> yeah. won't be going back there yeah, um, yeah i remember i was going to yeah. one of my first times san francisco uh, i was looking for like fuzz like one of my favorite foods so vietnamese and i was like just searching like on yelp and it's like the number one pit place and i've never been to san francisco so it's like okay it's in the tenderloin blah blah, blah. and so i'm <laughs> going like I, I pull up and i park and i'm like with my mother-in-law and like you know, like, let's visit San Francisco and the, just the crazy stuff that you see. And we're just like, <laughs> are we willing to brave, you know, the next hour? Uh, and whatever happens to, you know, our car or anything. Yeah, get... yeah, we walked. We walked through it, which was a bad idea because we were looking for parking and everything was so expensive. And then we were like, oh, but here's a garage for $10. We found the best spot. And then we got out and weird stuff that i won't mention on the air we yes. just saw it and i was like ah let's just get to where we're going and get back yeah great, great <laughs> all <man>. right <laughs> um yeah so as we're wrapping this up um do you have any requests for my audience and uh how can people reach out to you yeah so i did um i actually started my own podcast it's called b3 re um our show is actually we we take questions from listeners so people call in they leave a voicemail to the number and then we answer them on the air so my request would be if people can just um listen subscribe send us questions we'll answer it on the air i don't know if you do show notes but yeah. i can give you like the the link and the phone number to call in um we've started building that our instagram at be free re and then if anybody wants to get in contact with me i'm on bigger pockets um just by my name and then my website's 412agent.com. Anybody can text me, email me, whatever. My contact information's out there on the internet, so they can they can reach out to me if they're interested in getting an answer or something like that. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Well, Duke, that was an awesome show. Uh, Tony definitely uh, dogged on my water strategy there, but uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, every market's a little bit different, but I definitely loved his, uh, his insight on the uh, utility optimization in terms of uh, heat and cooling. Um, you know, we see mini splits out here in Hawaii a lot. I didn't know that they made mini splits that had heat in them. Uh, I just always thought they, they were um, air conditioning. So uh, something new I learned was that you can get a mini split system in unit um, that has both heat and air conditioning that will be a lot more cost efficient than uh, running a building boiler system. So that's that definitely something I took note of. Um, also, when you're, you're picking a partner, especially out of state, the importance of uh, making sure that you build that relationship, uh, you know, on trust, uh, you make sure that 
your partner's character, uh, morals, values, and goals all align with yours in order to have a, a long, um, stable uh, relationship that you guys can grow with as the, as the building grows. So uh, that was also a uh, note taken from me. And then also I like his strategy on using the out-of-state uh, investors um, or partners as, as debt partners um, and his strategy to go and use debt partners acquire an asset, stabilize it, and then refinance on long-term debt paying his investors back. Um, it was, was a good strategy. I, I hear a lot and uh, it's definitely looked like it's worked out well for him. And if you're interested in connecting with us, go to tricityequity.com to learn more. To connect with like-minded investors, join our Facebook group, Honolulu Multifamily and More. And if you found value in this podcast, please share and give us a rating and review on iTunes. See you next time.